Very welcome. Very welcome to this inauguration uh, lecture. There are actually three lectures uh, now coming up the coming three hours. There will be three lectures. And uh, the, I think the common theme is waste. And I don't think it will be a waste of time, so it's, uh, I think it will be very interesting uh, talks about, uh, about what to do with the waste and how can we even make more of, of the waste. So, uh, I'm Roland Larsson, I'm the Dean of the Engineering uh, Faculty at LTU, and uh, so I will be the kind of chairman here uh, during the day. And, uh, <clears throat> and as you may know, the inauguration lectures are given by the new professors. So we have, so that means that we have actually three new professors that will present themselves and the work they are doing and will do. And, uh, and uh, they also, uh, we had a ceremony p the past weekend in, uh, at the university and then they received the, the diploma for their professorship from the rector's or vice chancellor's hand. So, so now they will show what they will do with the diploma and, 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 uh, and their time at the university. So we will start with the first one, and that is Professor Bernard Dold. And uh, he, he's a new chair professor, that means that he's responsible for a certain discipline at the university, and that is applied geochemistry. I think the second one is also in the same field, but in another name. But we'll come to that in an hour or so. So, yeah. But a few words about uh, about Bernard, and I guess you will tell more about yourself later. But uh, as I understand, you studied geology in Heidelberg, so you are from Germany. So he's an import from Germany. So he's, uh, he has been here a few months, or uh, or uh, or so. But uh, but now he's here then to the chair professor. So he has that background on geology, uh, as I understood also, that you, you, you choose that subject because you wanted to see some change in the world or maybe improve the world or save the world. And, <laughs> and you used that education also to, you, you went to South America and uh, you, you're working with the uh, mining problems, maybe with waste already then. And then you came back to Germany and to uh, later also to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And you finished a PhD there in Switzerland, Geneva. Yeah. And uh, maybe you should tell yourself the rest of the story and uh, and uh, about your field in general. So, please, Bernard. Okay, thank you very much and welcome. I um, understand that you are so in the back because you have a better view, not because of me. <coughs> because it's a typical university situation that the students escape from the professor. So, well, my name is Bernard Dold, as he had mentioned. Thank you very much for the introduction. And in fact, when I was young, I still wanted to ch change the world. But uh, I always wanted to work with environment. And uh, one way was to go into this field with geology. It was with engineering in Germany or with geology. And I've chosen geology and it was the best choice of my life. So I never regret it because I'm doing exactly what I ever wanted to do. So the title here is uh, Mine Waste, Pollution Source or Geo-Resource, or better, I've heard uh, just last week, Wasted Geo-Resource. So Mine Waste, Wasted Geo-Resource. Is it a resource or is it really only waste? So it's all about sustainability in of mining. I suppose, uh, looking at the audience, most of you know that we need mining. We can't really survive without mining. We need the metals. If you think where our ancestors are living on the globe, so for example primates, where do they live to have a sustainable living? Are they living in Lulia? No. Because in this climate you can't really survive without metal, so all the primates are around the equator. And there was, it saw that also humanity started. And then slowly we spread it out. And there are only a few people on the globe which are able to survive without metals. 
I think you can count them um, some thousands if there are so many. We are not able to survive without metals. So we need mining, we will need mining in the future. But in effect, <coughs> mining has a very bad image. And when we are dealing, working with mining, we have to fight and trying to find solutions for this form of living. So if you look here at the beginning, the used re geo resources was water and soil, what's growing up there, so we used it. Then we changed, what, uh, there came fire and stone, so this is from my place uh, in southern Germany, where Neolithic civilization started. Uh, then minerals came in, and then sus we left sustainability. If we look nowadays, how we are functioning, how we are working, what are the motivations, all of this we need element, metals and energy. So we cannot survive without metals. Just think uh, if you have an accident and you uh, need an uh, operation, if you use a stone to uh, take out your tumor in the brain, this will hurt, you will not survive longer time. So all the change in expectation in living time, it's all based on metals. But there are also extraction of metals which are not so sustainable and really not needed. For example, when you think the women always want to marry and you need gold for a wedding ring, but the, well, you have to uh, get this gold and nowadays you extract this and this, I put it just a, a gold mine when you have three grams per ton gold in there and that's nowadays a very good one. So usually they work with one gram per ton or even less. But in this material of rock where we extract this gold to wet, there is not only gold, there are also other minerals. So it's always a different mineral assemblage. And these are nasty ones. For example, the sulfide pyrite is an iron sulfide. When it's oxidizing, it's producing sulfuric acid. And this sulfuric acid then can leach other elements and contaminate our groundwater or drinking water. So there we have a conflict between the need of a one source, which is in this case, case gold, which is not very needed for the technical development. It's mainly for jewelry and uh, speculation. When we have crisis, gold price goes up. Technical application for gold are very limited. So here you see the this is uh, the only small formulas I will show. We will produce, for example, in this case, calculation 33 kilograms of sulfuric acid, which then can leach the rock and contaminate the water. And this is how it's done nowadays. This is a picture from a big mining open pit in Chile, the biggest copper producer at the moment in the world, Escondida. So here you see all the problems. You have the open pit, you have waste dumps, you have tailings ponds. And I put it here, some uh, tailings, just in um, this place, so you can see it's a very fine grounded rock. It's like wheat, extremely fine nowadays. And here you see in the, all this rock we extract from this mine, you see different mineral composition. And I want to highlight here, these are different samples from this type of ore deposit, which have a different composition of each color is a different mineral. And what we are targeting to extract is only a very, very small part of the very whole volume we are extracting. So it, depending on which uh, element you are addressing, you only extract in case of gold 0.0001% or up to 10% usually. In iron ores you can go 30 to 60%. Yeah? But you always have a very big amount of silicates, which in this case is the waste. Yeah? And this waste is contaminated with other minerals like the pyrite I've shown you, which can then produce acidity and contaminate the water. Yeah? So then the end product, and that's what I've been working the last 25 years, is acid mine drainage or acid rock drainage. And here you see nicely this red color is from iron, from the ferric iron. 
So here nature tells you if it's red, it's danger, don't drink it. Yeah, that's normal. But that's the main environmental problem we are dealing with in mining nowadays. And this is the equation. The only thing I want to that you learn here that we produce at the end sulfuric acid in this process. Yeah, so we have their acidification of the environment and then we can leach all the um, heavy metals and other elements into the water phase. Sometimes you don't see the danger here in this case, for example, we have arsenic as a contaminant, so you don't see it. Yeah, Here, this is in Mexico, so the kids are playing. Also, some picture that you get an uh, impression for me, aesthetically, it's very nice, very colorful. More colors, more metals, yeah, different metals. So this is in Peru, a short tailings department. This is in Argentina. This is also acid mine drainage, but it's solid form. When you're in the desert, it's leaving all the water and then you have effluent salts forming, like here, this is melanterite. Oh, in Rio Tinto, in Spain, nicely the Schwertmanite. Oh, in Chuquicamata, chrysocol forming nowadays. So you see, it's very colorful, very nicely. But this shows you always these are metals which are mobilized and re-precipitated. So during mining, we have different uh, stages of the formation of this acid mine drainage in an active mine tailings impoundment. We do, um, don't have yet the acidification. We have mainly uh, other elements as contaminate in solution, like sulfate, because simply the, the minerals are in contact, like gypsum, with the water, and they dissolve in their equilibrium. They will liberate sulfate. At this stage, our patient, he is only pale. He is not very ill, but so we can prevent, and we should prevent in this stage. If we don't prevent and the system goes further on, this means we stop operation, oxidation starts, then we liberate the uh, iron into the system. You will have a, a, a iron plume in this impoundment and this can then migrate to the groundwater or the surface water. If this happens, then it can oxidize and then you see the precipitation of iron minerals. And this is this reddish color, like you have the iron minerals using for painting uh, your houses redly. This is a t similar mineral precipitating. And if you still don't do anything about it, then the system will acidify completely. And then you have this, all these different colorful uh, minerals forming because you leach out all the metals in the system. So here, you have really yet, the, the patient is yet ill and the only thing you can use or make here for remediation is treatment. So you have to collect and treat long time the water and clean it up. So the idea is always to prevent. So if you get uh, the patient pale, you have to think what he could have in the future and you have to prevent it. And when the people see big piles of mine waste coming out red water. People, specifically here in uh, South America, they are very reluctant to mining. They say, no, we don't want mining because you contaminate our water. We are working in agriculture. You take our base of existence. So all the conflicts, the social conflicts, are based on water mining issues. And also here in the Arctic, you know, in Sweden, you also have the similar problem, not as aggressive in Peru. There are nearly every day's uh, uh, conflicts, also sometimes with deaths. So they are really aggressive and uh, severe social problems. So social license is lost mainly in South America and around the globe. So we have to regain the social license. We have to convince society that we can operate a mine in a way that it will not harm the ecosystem. So what we are doing and what I did I do the last 25 years, I was looking in different ore deposits, in different waste situations, different climate, how this system reacts, how sulf uh, sulfide oxidation and this acid mine drainage is forming. 
So I was looking in uh, the big mines in Chile and Colombia, Peru, and then with time I changed in order to predict the problem. Because the, in many of these countries they uh, changed the legislation, so they had to make a closure play plan, they had to predict this problem, so we had a lot of work with these mining companies in order to ca characterize the mineralogy and then predict what will happen there. Also now, when you have a lot of problems on land, mining industry is thinking sometimes to send the tailings into the sea, when you're close to the sea. This happens in Norway, this also in Chile they are doing it. In Indonesia there are some countries which are doing this, some countries which want to do it. And we are working also in the prediction what might happen in this different uh, geochemical situation. We worked also in Antarctica, now here in uh, Lulia I will work on the sulfidic soil problem because it's very similar, it's a similar problem. But we also work in uh, the ore genesis, exploration, all what we call super genes, so the interaction between the atmosphere and the rock. There, This interaction mobilizes the elements and uh, sometimes it's enriching them as a secondary ore deposit. And we use this process also for production of metals in bioleaching operations. So we are trying to understand the system and use these processes to optimize the mining process. There are many problems in the actual mining process and one of the main problems is how the decision making is done. And you here see, you see uh, the evolution of what we call a cutoff grade. This means the percentage of, in this case, copper when the material goes into the process, which means milling, uh, producing uh, this small powder, very, uh, fine grain powder, in order to be able to separate the mineral which is from interest, from economic interest. So we are targeting even not 1% of all the rock we are extracting. And the decision is only made on uh, the, the value of this element, the copper, but we are extracting minerals. So th this leads to an extraction process which is not very efficient. So f for example in uh, copper, if it's below 0.1%, it's directly sent to waste dump. If it's in between, we send it to bio leach. This means bacteria help us to produce, uh, liberate the process. And if it's above, it's going to crushing and then to the smelter. So you see different parts of the order, but it goes through different um, processes. But this decision making leads that in all our different waste material which is coming up or which we are building up afterwards, we have sulfides, these minerals which react then with the atmosphere and produce the sulfuric acid. So everywhere we lose money because we have to take care about this, we have to remediate this. So that it's not a very efficient way to extract our metals. Yeah, we can do better. We lose a lot of money, that's the point. Yeah? And we are contaminating the system. On the same time, we've observed in the last 10 years that the ore grades, this means how much of the elements are in an uh, ore deposit, is decreasing constantly. Yeah. So this is also for copper, good mines had uh, close to 1%, then it came down, and this is for Chile, 0.6%, and for example, you know ITIC, they are working with 0.2% of copper, and they are earning a lot of money, so they are very efficient. I think it's the most efficient uh, copper mine in the world. Yeah? And here they are working with 0 06, 04 percent. So in general we can say that the recovery is the evolution of the recovery of the metal, how much metal we get out from our material we are extracting, at the beginning was really bad, so we had about 60-70%. Uh, Nowadays we are, in the case of copper, 80-90%. 
And then, for example, biomining is very bad. It's between 5 and 40 percent only. Small-scale mining with mercury extraction is only 30 to 50 percent. Magnetic extraction, like in the case of um, Kiruna, is very efficient. It's 95 percent. But in all these mines, we didn't look on other elements, which are now we are looking a lot, like these rare earth elements you might have heard, or platinum group. All these elements we need for the high-tech society and also to the for the change of energy, susta uh, more sustainable energy supplies. So uh, every green technology needs this different type of uh, elements or metals. So in this trend we can see that old mine waste is a pollution source because we just thrown it away and it's we thrown it in the river and it's reacting and contaminating the water. But it's also nowadays a geo resource. So the org rate of old mine waste is often higher than what we are working nowadays in the mine. Yeah, so we have to look on this. And if you look, for example, in this critical element global map, you see that we always have one element, and then, for example, in Brazil, neobimium, it's 90%. Or if you look to China, rare earth elements, it's 99 in the heavy, and in the light, 87. This does not mean that in other countries there are not these elements available. It's simply the production nowadays is concentrated mostly on one location because the rest didn't care about it. So these are the richest ore deposits but there are many around in the globe and now we have to learn to explore them and see where we have these so needed elements. Because now you see here the change in the element use and all these green energies now need much more different elements and this means we will have more mining and different mining in the future. So uh, no mining is not really a realistic statement. We have to think how we mine. And for example, in South America, there is a lot of mine waste because they are very old mine, mining countries. Peru, since the colonization, uh, they had mining and even before. And here, you also in Chile have now a good uh, registration of all mine waste sites. And if you look here, for example, they have just this year came out with a, a database. They have now 9.2 billion tons of tailings in the whole country. And uh, some new geochemical data shows that uh, it's average 0.23% of copper. And if you think ITEC is working with 0.2, take it out from the ground milling, which is 30% of the production costs, this for Boliden, all this should be mine. Yeah. So there is a lot of resource out in the world to explore. We have to know what is in there. We are just starting to explore what's in there. And then we have to develop techniques in order to extract the metals from the waste which is a resource and it's yet milled in most cases and then you have an easy and efficient way to extract this material. Now I will not go into this but uh, when you have a lot of waste uh, around then you have the problem of social license and for example in Chile I can tell you mining industry is trying to think now should we not send this mine tailings into the sea, into the deep sea, so we don't have this problem? What's the idea behind this submarine's tailings disposal? They did it in the 70s, yet around the globe, in the States, in Canada, in several places, with very bad experience. There was a lot of uh, contamination associated. The idea is that we have these minerals which are born in the earth's crust, they are stable there, they are happy there, we take them out. If we put them into, again, into a reducing environment, then they should be stable. Yeah, that's the idea. Everybody thinks deep sea is reducing. 
that there is no oxygen there. Yeah, so it should be stable. The reality is different. The deep sea is not reducing, it's oxidizing. Yeah, so in the real deep sea you have oxidizing conditions, so you can, for example, produce these manganese oxides, the noodles. Only in the shelf you have an uh, oxygen minimum zone where you can have reducing uh, conditions. And if you put material sulfides in this zone, they might be stable, but you can also put oxide minerals in this zone and then they might dissolve, they destabilize. So we're always dealing with different types of mineral which are stable in certain conditions and we have to think what happens when we change the geochemical situation of these minerals, when we put it somewhere or not. And this takes me then to the other theme, because we have these tailings, which is fine-grained material we want to send into the sea. Dump it in the sea so don't, we don't have any problem. But nowadays we have another problem with geosource resources, and this is sand. Sand, everybody uh, thinks uh, sand, uh, we have enough sand for everything. But nowadays we understand that this is not the case. There is a scarcity on sand. Sand is mainly extracted illegally around the globe. So it's a free resource, everybody can take it. And they are doing so, they are sand mafias it's called. So it's a very critical uh, system also, even UNEP is now coming on the plan, oh this is a problem, we have to think about it. For example, I don't know the, if you know Dubai, it's built with sand, because cement is two-thirds is sand. If you want to build a building like this, you need a lot of sand. And in Dubai, from where it's coming, the sand, from Australia, because Dubai has not the proper sand to build this, so they had to bring it from Australia to build all this up. So sand is also a geo resource. We need a lot of them. It's the third one, mostly used resource from all the resources. So we are, there are calculations, this is because it's mo mainly a black market, there are no real data, 15 to 0 mil billion tons per year. And it costs also, it has a value. So when you buy sand for your construction, you pay average around $8 per ton. If you have a industrial sand, this means you can use for a certain industrial process, this can go up up to 150, 170 uh, dollars per ton. Yeah, so it has a value. But it's also starting to get polemic. Yeah, because there are also negative environmental issues associated with the sand production. And this is from India. So there are people who don't want to that sand mining is taking place. So we have two negative. So we are making mathematics now. Negative plus negative becomes positive. So what we are trying now in the future to combine is we have the environmental impact of mining, destruction of the ecosystem, water contamination, acid rock drainage, airlock transport, all the associated problems. On the other hand, we have environmental impact of sand mining. So it's at the moment it's a free geo resource, everybody takes it only. Yeah, nobody pays for it, so it's a good benefit. It's a destruction of the ecosystem. All the beach erosion you're hearing nowadays, it's due to sand mining, principally. So uh, we have two problems to solve. Now, when we are mining, we have to characterize our geo resource efficiently. Yeah, and nowadays you just look on the target mineral, which is for copper or for gold or for molybdenum, at most you take two or three out of them, but the rest you ignore. But if you nowadays we have the technique, for example, with automatic quantitative mineralogy, we can quantify the, all the minerals in our sample. And if we have this information, then we can design extraction lines more efficiently. Not only if we have this information. 
We even need to know which other trace elements are associated with the different minerals to in order to predict if they can be liberated in the future to the environment. Yeah. So we need this information. Nowadays we have these high-tech tools. We need to understand very closely the mineralogy, but we need also to understand the water chemistry because water and minerals are interacting. And additionally, we need to understand the microbiology, which are also interacting in there. So I you see it's a pretty complex system. So you need a lot of data, a lot of high-tech machinery in order to make the analyze, and then you can predict what will happen. You also model this in uh, with geochemical modeling codes, you can predict which element will liberate in which conditions in the future. Yeah. So that's what we are do doing. We are trying to understand the minerals which we have in our ore deposit. Nowadays you can quantify, you can say how much, for example, sulfuric acid will produce of the rock you see there. Or if no if it has enough carbonase in order to neutralize it. Yeah. Again, here in this case, we are targeting only a few ore minerals in mining nowadays. It's only a very small percentage of the whole volume, but the rest are only sand, uh, silicates, which is nothing more than sand. Now, in the process we are doing nowadays, this sand has some contaminating minerals like sulfites, which we don't extract, like pyrite, and this makes this sand useless. So what we have to do in the future, we have to se separate different mineral groups and then produce different products which we can use for different purposes. Just to give you an idea of the value, uh, that's a project we are working in Chile. It's an old tailings impoundment. They have to move it because the, the, the pit is expanding. And it's 270 million tons of 0.5% copper. So for ITIC, this would be a very good resource because they are working nearly with half. And it's yet milled. So only the value of copper, it's about 6 billion US. Yeah. All the rest of this material, if you see it as sand, it's 2 billion of US. So it's also money, which we are only throwing away. If you can characterize it correctly and separate, or for example, an industrial quartz, if you have a very nice quartz in this uh, deposit, you would have even more value. It would be 8 billion, only the quartz in this material. So you have to understand what minerals you have and which you can separate. And if you use all the materials, then you save the remediation cost. And if you don't produce any waste material, society will not claim that you are contaminating the surroundings. You only benef give benefit to the society. So you gain back the social license slowly. This will take a lot of time because confidence to gain back, it's not so easy. So we need time. So this is, for example, just a simple um, uh, sequence you might, with the available technique, apply. For example, first you use cy a cyclone, you separate the heavy minerals, and in the heavy minerals you have all these critical elements enriched, yeah, like raw earth or platinum, because they are all heavy. So they are producing the heavy minerals. Then you'd make a classical flow station for copper, zinc, whatever you need. Then you take out the sulfides, which are no nowadays in the waste, like the pyrite, pyrotite. So you prevent this acid mine drainage in this big volume. You can even take out the, the iron oxides. And you can even separate the different silicates. Yeah. So you can make a sequ sequence of separation and you're producing products. This is technically pro no problem, but uh, a copper mine, they have the experience in copper, so they don't care about the rest. So we have to convince them, possibly we have to oblige them with legislation in order to do a different way of mining. 
but it's it's possible it's not always 100% feasible that's clear we always end up with some uh, waste material we have to deal with for example arsenic there is no use we have to deposit in a very secure way but if you use mineral as decision making in the mining process then we can design different and optimize the process in order to produce products instead of mi mine waste and we produce more efficient uh, extraction methods like bio leaching we can uh, improve a lot so at the end we are earning a much more money and we prevent environmental contamination so we have to go away from this image, what mining has nowadays, of nucleus of destruction to go to a nucleus of sustainable growth. So when we have, for example, sand at the producing sand or quartz sand, we can attract glass industry or cement industry to the mine site and then build up a, a society around the mine which has a longer sustainable system. So we are trying here to work with the, in LTU in a sustainable mine town development. So between mining, architecture and cement uh, engineering, we are trying to work in this direction to optimize and the geo resource in, t in its total. And for example, for future mining in the Andes, when you're close to the sea and you separate these flows yet, the prediction is that the big cities, the big population will be around in the shores. So the mega cities are developing in shorelines. So when you're close to the ocean and in the Andes, you have the gravity which flow helps you flowing the tailings down. You just separate the different minerals groups and then you can export them, send them to uh, Dubai like the Australian did it and sell it as sand yeah, and you earn money and you don't produce any mine waste or only a m smaller volume you and then uh, you have the chance to get back the social license yeah in the end is at the moment no big mine can operate or open because uh, they lost the social license so at the end what can a miner learn from a butcher the butcher had a lot more experience, more time to really understand the anatomy of his animal to extract everything, earn money with everything. But in mining we are taking only the sirloin steak out and the rest of the cow we are throwing into the river or the lake or into the sea. Yeah? And by doing so, of course, it will contaminate. So what we have to learn is in Peru, with the heart, they make anticucho. The tourists like it very much, so they make money. In Germany, we make even from the blood money. Yeah. So that's what we are learn have to learn in mining also. We have to learn to extract efficiently our geo resource. Taxamiket. <laughs> I like that um, um, with the sausage. Yeah, <laughs> we need to learn how to make sausages of the of the ore. Yeah, but I guess you have a number of questions. I hope you have at least. Are you too shy? No, here we have. No, wait, wait a minute. You, you need to use the microphone because otherwise they can't hear you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. And um, yes, I was wondering, you said uh, dumping in the sea doesn't work for tailings. Uh, and in the end, you don't want to have any tailings anymore. Do you want to use everything or mostly everything? But w from what's left, and you said arsenic, you can't maybe use it. Um, what's your suggestions for where to deposit? And especially, so I was thinking about sulfides, sulfide-rich pyrite. What to do with that? Oh, yeah, I forgot this. Low-grade ore nowadays is mainly uh, in the, the big porphyry copper system like Escondida, Chukicamata, the real biggest one. This slide between uh, cutoff and CO1 is sent to BioLeach. What I've said. But this is very inefficient because it's uh, chalcopyrite is sent to BioLeach. 
Yeah? Chalco pyrite, copper iron sulfide mineral, is not, the bacteria are not able at the normal temperature, what's in these deposits, in these waste dumps, it's about 30 to 40 degrees. The population which is around working there, they are not able to oxidize chalco pyrite. If you go, I just been last month uh, on a bio hydrometallurgy conference in Germany, and uh, from in Iran they have shown very nicely if you manage to go up to 50 degrees or more, then you manage to oxidize it. So what you're doing with the pyrite when you produce desulfurized tailings, what we call this, then you can produce sulfuric acid directly before it was mined to produce sulfuric acid. But you can, uh, the oxidation of uh, pyrite is exothermic, so it produces heat. So you can use it in your leach pile in order to increase the temperature to 50 degrees, and then you have a more efficient uh, uh, copper extraction. Yeah? That's my proposition for the use of pyrite. We need it. It's our energy source. Yeah? And you transform it in a stable form, which is uh, an oxide, but you have the acidity produced you have to deal with. So you will always have to deal with some problems. The problem is the dimension of the volume, which makes it impossible to deal with it in the future. Yeah? The tailings we've been working there, the, the biggest is 55 square kilometers. Yeah? Many of them, there are 20 square kilometers. And they're planning now for a waste dump in uh, Chile, which will be one kilometer high. One kilometer high. Yeah? So we are entering in a new dimension of mining. Because of the ore rate is going so down, we need to extract much more volume. Yeah? And this means much more waste material. So we have to transform the waste material into resource, into product. Uh, yes, please. Uh, when in the future, perhaps the distant future, will uh, nuclear waste become a continued energy source for energy uh, production uh, in favor of uh, digging it at present time down 500 meters or so to uh, be there for 500,000 years? Yeah, well, that What's your view on that? The, well, the nuclear waste at the moment, uh, if I understood well, here in Sweden, you're starting to do the for final deposition. I'm not sure if it's yet decided. So you are the only country in the globe who has a final deposition. Uh, we know from Germany, we ha had ASE, which uh, was predicted that it was safe. We had the groundwater coming in. We have to dig everything out again. So uh, the recycling of the nuclear waste might be a solution also. But I'm not very aware how the technical uh, situation is there at the moment. But uh, except of Sweden, nobody, no politician wants to take the responsibility to make this decision. At least in Germany, they ch just will make uh, now 30, 40 years of exploration if there is a site to do so. So uh, perhaps the, the, the recycling, uh, if more research is uh, done in this direction, could be a solution. But don't ask me time frame. That's always, even in the prediction of this acid rock drainage, we are working every day. The prediction in time, I, I would say we cannot do it realistically. We only can say it will happen. It's the same with earthquake. We can say it will happen in Iran and Iraq, or it will happen in uh, Chile or Peru, but when, it's extremely difficult. But for decision making, the question is also, need we know when it's happening, or is it enough that we know that it will happen to take decisions? That's uh, also, in this case, always the question. And I believe if we know that it will happen, we have to take action yet. And not only wait because until it, uh, something happens.
All right. Uh, do we have some final, very, very short question? It's, we are reaching the end of the 45 minutes time slot here. So thank you very much, Bernard. It was a very interesting talk, and we are looking forward to learn more about your work here now in the future at uh, at the university here. So thank you very much, and thank congratulations you. to to your professor title. Yeah. Thanks, I make it. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm.